stop Vikings talk. It's Purple Daily on Score North and scorenorth.com. Purple Daily on draft every Monday right here on the Purple Daily YouTube channel. Happy New Year to you. We're coming at you on a New Year's here today on 2024. Tyler Fornis, Miles Gorham, Declan Goff here to bring you through Purple Daily on Draft. We still do this every Monday. We're going to continue to do this every Monday. Uh, we're going to have a bigger picture conversation here because the Vikings lost to the Packers. They got embarrassed by their biggest rival on home turf. Jaron Hall got pulled. We're going to get into that as well, but figured that we should start this conversation with a little bit of, you guessed it, some draft talk because that's where a lot of people are kind of turning their attention to now that the Vikings are sitting outside the playoff picture. They could still get in, but they're going to need a lot of help plus a big win in Detroit. So playoffs probably obviously in the rearview mirror here. Now we're looking forward with the calendar literally turned to 2024. Why not get into things uh, starting with this new year? So we're going to start some draft talk here. And yesterday, uh, our friend, uh, our coworker, if you will, Phil Mackey, set the Vikings Twitter ablaze when he said the Vikings could have a shot at a top 10 pick. And some people interpreted that as, well, you want the Packers to win then, you're not a real Vikings fan, which is just kind of comical. That's not necessarily what he was saying. Uh, But there are a lot of fans still, regardless, whether how you fell on going into that game and obviously the result played out. But there are a lot of fans who are confused of what's the point of having a top 10 pick, which the Vikings now have a shot of getting instead of just having the 18th pick. Is it really that big of a difference? So I really want to dumb this conversation down and I I want you guys to explain to people why a top 10 pick? Again, I know it's rhetorical to a degree, but Forno, why a top 10 pick is definitely more beneficial for the future of the Vikings than having, let's say, the 19th pick and being one and done in the wild card round. First off, I just want to say nobody knows how to incite a riot on social media like Phil Mackey. The, true. There are some people who are just better at things than others, and there's nobody better than Phil. But when it comes to a top 10 pick, look, you, you just have a better talent pool to pick from. And no matter what, you still have to hit on the picks. That That's the key. It doesn't matter if you're pick one, pick 20, pick 200. You still have to hit when you take the player. But your odds significantly increase the higher the number the pick is because you have a bigger and better talent pool to pick from. Uh, Pro Football Reference has their own value metrics. They value the 10th pick as 40% more likely to hit and more valuable than the 22nd pick. So that just that 12 pick difference, 40% more valuable. That's significant when you're talking about a first round pick that could mean, Hey, this guy might make a pro bowl or two to a hall of famer. You know, some of that is hyperbole. It all depends on the player. It all depends on the situation and the coaching staff being able to extract the most out of him. But the higher the pick, theoretically, the better the player and the better chance for success. Now you don't want to necessarily lose games to be able to get those picks, but but that's also just how it works. So if you have a top 10 pick, theoretically, you have a much better chance to hit. You have a much better chance for them to be a massive impact player on your football team. And you have a much better chance for that guy to potentially make the Hall of Fame. And that's a huge benefit, especially when you're a team like the Vikings and you have cornerstones at both tackles, two wide receivers, and you have it hopefully Daniel Hunter long-term as well. That's a good base to start from. Now, there's a lot of questions elsewhere, but when you have the base, now you add a top 10 pick in there and it can really help accentuate this kind of competitive rebuild that we've been dealing with over the past couple of seasons. So, Miles, I saw you were tweeting about uh, quarterback potential futures too with the Vikings, what you'd like to see happen uh, on on Twitter or X this morning too, on Monday morning, and you know, you, you kind of alluded to the fact of, hey, drafting a quarterback might be the Vikings' best possible solution here and not just mm-hmm. bringing back Kirk and washing everything away and saying Kirk Cousins will, you know, rip up all the Band-Aids that, or, or should repair all the <laughs> Band-Aids that this roster has. Uh, so, obviously, you would like to see the Vikings take a quarterback. Do you think if they're at, you know, at that 9-11 to 11 range that they have a shot at landing one of those QBs? Or do you think that still is probably more of a trade-up situation to get one of the quarterbacks that maybe you'd like to see the Vikings take? Yeah, well, to kind of answer the question you asked Forno, too, is like the higher the pick, the more flexibility. Like, and that's that in itself is is maximum opportunity. You can trade up, trade down. You can accumulate. You can get a really good player in those cases. There's a lot of things that you have at your um, at your feet that you don't always have when you're in the back of the back of the draft. Now, now being in the back of the draft is usually a good thing because that usually means you have a good team. 
But the Vikings have done so good at like playing that middle ground, being like we're kind of good at at points, but kind of not that great, you know. But they've always re- been really good at playing that middle ground and then hitting the like really good on rare occasions where they're rarely really bad too. So the Vikings are really good at playing that middle ground. So I think <clears throat> for folks saying like we should be we should have a higher pick right now at this stage and in, in like the end of the season, it's warranted because they're not going anywhere this season. I think it's clear last if last night didn't tell people that I don't know what. <laughs> what else they need. Um, and with the quarterback situation, the, like the roster just being depleted of, with injuries. Um, but to, now to go back to your question in terms of like being in that nine to 11 range, um, you have a shot at getting one of those top three, top four quarterbacks, depending on like how things shake out, but it's harder. It's less likely that the top three guys fall that far, especially Williams and may. Um, I think Jane Daniels is probably going to boost himself up in that top 10 as well. But being in that, that range gives you more flexibility and it's easier to move up in that case. It's going to be expensive to move up, but we saw even last year as a prime example, the Vikings had picked 23. All the rumors around were that they were interested in moving up for a quarterback. Well, the top three guys went in the top four picks. And one of the things that they missed out on was the fact that no team wanted to move all the way back to 23, even if the uh, cost was a lot. So the issue that they ran into there was they just didn't have the, the, the they might've had the ammo, but they they just were too far back. Teams don't want to move twenty plus, you know, twenty picks, twenty ish picks, you know, to to make that type of trade most of the time, especially in a, a QB heavy class like that. Um, this this year is probably similar. So if you're the Vikings and you're sitting around that tenth pick, a team is probably more likely to to move back. And when you give them the, the king's ransom that you would, like the Panthers did last year to move up to one, then then being from at pick twenty three, pick fifteen, pick twenty. So you just give yourselves more of an opportunity, more flexibility to move up. And you might not even, and you have more opportunity to move up. Maybe let's say Jane Daniels falls to like six, a little bit easier to move up to six from, from nine, 10, 11, than from 15, 20, right. Right. And the cost might not be quite as much. And so there's a lot of those things that go into play there too. And if all things shake out and things aren't, and you can't go up and get the quarterback, you could also trade back from one of those spots. Now I know that's an unpopular opinion. I probably would struggle with that as well, but like we, you never know how things shake out. But the higher the pick you have, just the more flexibility and the more ammo um, it takes to either move up or more ammo you can get back in a trade back in a lot of those scenarios too. So I just love the flexibility that it gives you. And you're just not you're just a team that needs a lot of assets. Now, I think QB is the biggest one for the future, not just 2024, but beyond. Um, you'll need more assets too. So if a trade back does happen in that case, at least then you're getting hopefully premium capital to move back as well. So Forno, are, are you in the camp of maybe moving back if one of those three quarterbacks is off the board? And we'll we'll call it Jaden Daniels for now, but you could obviously you can create your own scenario here. But if the three quarterbacks, obviously Williams May one and two with the bullet, and then Daniels with as the third quarterback, if he's off the board by the time the Vikings are on the clock at pick ten, let's call it ten, are you interested in a trade back, or are you kind of you obviously want to see the board play out a little bit before maybe you pick up the phone and make a deal? I'm Texas King. What's the context of the time of the trade? Who's available? What are the offers? Do you have an offer to go from like, let's say they have pick 11. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Saints drafted Chris Olave right in front of the Vikings at 12 at pick 11. What did they give up? I believe they gave up a third. You, I, I'll take a third to go back from 11 to 16. Like mm-hmm. that, I, I think it all depends on what the context is. Am I going to want to jump back to 20? Probably not. But am I getting a first round pick to do so? like the Giants did when they traded with the Bears so they could get fields. Yeah, I'll probably take that. I think the context of the trade versus what's on the board really determines that value conversation because if you have, let's say, Laiatu Latu, one of the best pass rushers in the draft is on the board and you clear his medicals, you're comfortable with the neck because that's going to be a massive talker for him. If you're comfortable with the neck and you believe that this guy could be the next big thing for your defense, then you just sit there and take him. And if you don't, and if you're just like, you know what? I'm comfortable with about eight guys. I like eight guys in the same bucket, the same value. I'll trade down to 17. And you know what? I'm going to guarantee myself at least two or three of those guys that I'll be able to pick from. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the context of what's going on on draft day, which for us trying to understand the thought process and what could happen is a really difficult proposition because there's so many different variables, and that's why I really believe in looking at mock drafts as ridiculous and redundant as they are. 
because you can see trends and you can see how the industry values certain people. And not only all of that, but you can see what different situations are. And that's why at Vikings Wire, we do at least one full mock draft a week because it shows you what, what can happen when this happens. What happens if Caleb Williams somehow falls to five? It's not going to happen. But what happens if it does? How does everything shake up past that? Because there's always a surprise pick every single year that the dominoes start to fall a completely different way than you think. And are you ready for that situation? And that's why I love mock drafts so much because you can start to see some of those things. And that's going to frame that context discussion because we just don't know if it's a smart idea to trade back in January because we don't know what the board looks like. We don't know how testing looks like. We don't know medicals. And if if the value is right, I'm going to trade back every time because trade backs can go send you from 14 to 23 and get your Christian Darius off. Right. But it can also send you from 12 to 32 in draft Lewis scene. So we'll see what the context is at the time. But I, I just need more information to fully be able to get a give a concrete answer to that question, which I know for the listeners is frustrating, but that's just kind of the reality of the situation. Miles, I think I know your answer to this, but and I think a lot of fans are worried about this scenario playing out where let's say the three quarterbacks are off the board by the time the Vikings are on the clock at pick 10 and they go ponder 2.0 and they reach for someone, do you not want to see them take the fourth quarterback off the board that point at 10? Like, would that be too big of a reach for you to take like a J.J. McCarthy or a Penix at pick 10? Or you would be maybe okay with that? Because I know obviously with the first three guys that are probably going to be off the board by the time they are on the clock, and if the Vikings still really want a QB, but they haven't really felt out the trade back calls they want that are the best offer, would you be upset if they ended up taking a quarterback still just at their original spot, that'd be the fourth one off the board. Yeah. I don't think, I think reaching for a quarterback is always a, a bad move. Um, now I think at that, at that case, like if they had any idea that JJ McCarthy or Penix was like their guy and they had him in like a, as a top 15 pick on their board, that obviously changes things for them and why they'd make that decision. I don't view either of those guys as top, you know, 10 picks for sure. Um, but, I do, I do think that uh, – I don't think Kwesi and, and Kevin O'Connell would reach in that scenario. They just don't seem like those types of guys that are willing to reach beyond their uh, their board just to get a, pos- a certain position. Um, now, I do think in that case they'd probably look or attempt to try to trade back and maybe move up, try to move up at the end of the first round to try to make that type of move rather than sit and take a guy at, the, in, at, at 10 if they don't view that guy being, um, being worthy of that pick. I don't – that's the one thing I'm not as worried about with this regime – as the previous one, I think the previous one is a little bit more willing to to reach because they they felt it was a need that they had to fill and they didn't want to miss out on that need. Whereas I think Quasi and Co. They I think they're a little bit more willing to like let the board fall as it as it needs to a little bit more and, and kind of play things out. Um, now that's all luck and, and things too. Like luck goes into it. Like the Vikings trading back and in Quasi's first year and when they miss out on Kyle Hamilton or Jordan Davis and you know they they missed on their picks in those in those situations, right? So. That's the hard part. But in that in that instance, I wouldn't want to see them reach for somebody if that person wasn't viewed probably consensus as a top, you know, 15 pick. I'll I'll give a range of like, you know, a handful of picks at pick 10. Like let's say that he's 15 on a board, but you want to take him at 10 because you can't trade back far enough to get him and those types of things. I'll understand that. But if you're reaching like too extreme at consensus, that's where I typically tend to like um struggle with those types of picks. Counterpoint, if he's the guy, it doesn't matter. And that's the difficult conversation because you have guys who might be viewed as like, like mm-hmm. right now I have JJ McCarthy as a second round player. But if you think he's the franchise, you take him attending and you don't think twice. Well, if you think he's the franchise, then, then he's not going to be a second round pick though, right? Like you, you don't believe that he's going to be a second round pick, right? Like that's that plays into that as well. Well, I, it's it's also a difficult, difficult conversation because sometimes context can really muddy, muddy the situation. Sure. And I think J, with J.J. McCarthy and how that offense operates, it that's where context becomes really, really important because yeah. they don't ask him to do anything spectacular. They don't ask him to go in football games. He navigates the offense and they rely on the running game and a great defense, especially up front. That defensive line continues to produce freak after freak after freak. And 
like all these guys are like super high end Bruce Feldman's freak list. So that's why I use that word. And understanding that context, that, that's one of the reasons why I have him as a second round guy, because it's just, I don't have enough answers, but I can easily project him to be that superstar. And it's the same conversation I had with Will Levis last year. Levis, all the tools. And when he has it put together, he's great. But there is too much inconsistency. Well, what will Levis are you going to get? Are you going to have any form of consistency in the NFL? Is he going to be able to take a Josh Allen type leap because he has those type of tools? I, that's why he had a second round grade for me. I just needed more answers and context that I didn't have that I wasn't going to be able to have before the draft. And that's why McCarthy is there for me. But in the same way, I can see a team easily saying, hey, I see this, I see that, and I see all of these things that tell me he's the franchise guy. And even though I am void of some of that context, I'm easily projecting him forward. And that's that's where I think, even though I have him as a second-round guy, if you want to take him at 10, 12, 15, I really don't have a problem with it. If you give him that firm stamp of, of approval and saying, this is my guy, I'm going to ride or die with him. Whereas you mentioned earlier, the Christian Ponder pick was forced beyond belief. Like there wasn't this confidence saying, Hey, we believe in Ponder. He is our unquestioned guy. They just needed a guy. You do that with an edge rusher. You do that with a linebacker. You don't do that with quarterback. And I, I, that's where so much of this conversation we're going to have over the next four months is going to be focused around context because that's going to tell the entire story with everything. Yeah, and if they've identified, right, as McCarthy as their dude and they have the evidence and the reasoning and the rhetoric to back it up, then you could obviously make a case that you could see him going in that 10 to 15 range wherever they end up going. But yeah, I'm I'm really interested in the next four months. It's going to be fascinating. Let me ask you this too, Forno. Do you think there's too many holes on this Vikings roster to fix overnight in one draft? Or do you think that there's other guys on the roster that can take the next step forward? Or do you think that they can supplement some of these needs immediately with the draft this year with all the other holes, you know, at off or at defensive line, linebacker, cornerback, et cetera? Do you think that they can fill some of these needs immediately in one draft or is this going to be a few year process? That's going to be at least a two year process. Th that defense is void of talent. And it really started to come to fruition in the last few weeks because they schemed around the void of talent. I can't say this for certainty. But I don't think Brian Flores wanted to run a defense with three safeties. I don't think he wanted to have DJ Wanham play like 90% of the snaps every single week. And look, he outperformed our expectations of him. He deserves a lot of credit for that. But he didn't want Patrick Jones playing 50% of the snaps in these three edge looks. We don't have a bona fide nose tackle. Harrison Phillips played great. But if you slide him to a one gap player, he can make so much more of a difference if you get that two gapper and the linebackers look Hicks was really good for a while. He's just not the, the right athlete. And it showed on that Jaden Reed pulse touchdown because he's got to get deep in Tampa too. And he just can't do that. Uh, like you can ask that of Ivan pace and he's got his limitations, but he's at least going to be a lot faster and quicker to that spot to make it a little bit more of a challenging throw, despite his lack of uh, like radius, to be able to like impact the throw with it, with his arms and everything cut kind of, like that's where Anthony Barr in his prime would have been perfect. Imagine Anthony Barr running Tampa too. That's just tasty because of how great of an athlete he is and that wide wingspan. But peak Eric Hendricks was really good at that too. He was. Uh, and then you have cornerback Byron Murphy. Look, Caleb Evans had a pretty good year up until the last few weeks. Evans is a major question mark moving forward. Byron Murphy. Uh, you stayed relatively healthy this year, but then being out the last two weeks really crippled this defense. You can tell Blackman's a rookie. Who knows what Andrew Booth Jr. is going to be moving forward. This team is just void of talent at a lot of really important spots, and they're going to need to fortify it, and it's not a one-year process. The Vikings have $37 million in cap space, but they also don't ha have a quarterback, starting quarterback on the roster. They don't have Daniel Hunter, so basically they have one edge, two edge rushers. Andre Carter, the second and Pat Jones, the second, it's not exactly a winning formula and they're going to have to make a lot of really difficult decisions and it's going to take some time. Now, can Flores scheme this defense up even like, just like he did uh, this year to a point, but there needs to be adjustments and he hasn't shown that he's capable of doing that with this group. 
Not saying he can't do it, but he hasn't shown it yet. And I think we're we're in the midst of the defense is not really going to be where we want it probably till 2025 or 2026. And that's just because of the lack of talent in the room. Miles, do you think with this defensive line group, especially if Daniel Hunter walks and, you know, he gets a big payday somewhere else and, you know, DJ Wanham had a pretty significant injury. I mean, how, how the heck could the Vikings really rebuild that defensive line overnight, right? I mean, I feel like it's going to be, that's, that alone, that position group alone is going to be, right, like a two-year process to get it back to being respectable, which is a problem because I think the Vikings have always had historically really good defensive lines for the most part. But how the hell do you go into the, the offseason trying to rebuild an entire group of positions that you don't you don't even know how you're going to fill? Yeah, I mean, three of the top four edge rushers on this team right now are um, free agents and they're walking out the door and you need to bring at least one of them back. And I would, obviously we all would agree that it probably should be Hunter. Um, but at that, at, after that point though, you're looking at uh, probably dumpster diving in the in free agency and kind of going after a couple guys, maybe, maybe kind of taking the, the Baltimore Ravens approach where you kind of just go get a few guys, a um, few veterans and, and try to fill it that way while you make sure you draft a guy or two to develop. Um, but that's gotta be the, the approach you, you don't have, you're not gonna have enough money to go out and sign all the players in, in free agency, but you're also not going to have enough capital in the draft to, to draft multiple guys in high. So what you want to make sure to do is you kind of mix and match. I, I think that's the best approach they got to take is, you know, you try to bring Hunter back. Um, you let Patrick Jones play a little bit more. I mean, he's been, he's been, he's been solid. I mean, I mean, as a rotational guy, better than a, a full-time starter, but he played, you know, better than I expected him to last night, but he's probably not a full-time starter. Um, but then you have, you know, two more spots to fill probably there. And we'll see if Andre Carter can become anything, but you can't go into the offseason expecting him to be anything other than depth and, and development. So yeah, I'd say in that area, you, you'd really want to just kind of like piecemeal it and, and make sure you, you factor in, you know, cheaper veteran free agents or like young guys that kind of what crazy has been doing is going after like the, the guys that are after their out of their, their rookie contracts, looking for that second contract and kind of getting them at a little, little bit of a discount. I, I don't know the, the guys off the top of my head yet, but, um, we'll dive into that further as we go, but um, that'd be my approach. And then take take a guy early, you know, whether it's first, second, third round, somewhere within that range, maybe in fourth round, and and just try to take take that approach. That's kind of the best that's best route they kind of have right now because they don't have like an unlimited amount of cap space. What they do at quarterback, Justin Jefferson, Daniel Hunter. There's so many so many guys that need to either get paid or you know you need to resign just to make sure that you can kind of keep your roster intact. And so they're kind of in a tough situation there. Forno, let me ask you this. Do you think the Vikings are still in a competitive rebuild or are they more tracking towards just a full on flat line rebuild? Is it still competitive rebuild that Kwesi used when he was hired at his introductory press conference? Or is this more tracking towards a legitimate rebuild? I think that's a difficult question to answer because I think process versus results is going to really determine how you view it. The process is always going to be competitive rebuild. They're going to try and form the team in their vision for the future, but they're not going to completely give up on a season so they can have that reset. So I, I, I don't think we're just in this disaster zone where you just need to completely rip it apart and start completely over. There are good pieces on this team at premium positions, but there's just a void of talent and we're almost done getting rid of some of these bad contracts. The day it was signed, the Harrison Smith extension was an awful contract. It was a, hey, here's your Rolex for serving 30 years at the steel mill kind of deal. It was getting him paid for what he had done, not what he was going to do. And that is a dangerous proposition when it comes to contracts. Now, Smith has played well, but now you're looking at a bunch of dead money next year. And you can still save about $12 million by cutting him uh, before the start of the new league year. But you shouldn't have signed him to that kind of contract anyways. And dealing, Thanks, with, Rick. Yeah, dealing with some of that. Uh, and then you need to make decisions on Marcus Davenport, who's going to have, I think it's like 6.2 dead uh, with those void years that on. Now, if you bring him back on like a 1 million, 2 million, deal like hey you need to prove it because you got a big prove it deal and you didn't for multiple reasons now we're going to give you a small prove it deal then like if you sign him to a two year deal or sorry two million dollar deal you'd save a couple million on the cap like if you signed Daniel Hunter 
uh, to an extension, you give him 25 million average annual value. You'll only add like 11 million onto the cap. You sign Kirk to a, a one year, $30 million deal. You're only going to add around 10 million to the cap. Like there are ways to be able to kind of maneuver here and get talent in the building, but you're going to have to do uh, some thrift store shopping. You're going to have to hit on guys in those third, fourth, and fifth waves of free agency that can come in here and play really good football and be like that 80th, 90th, 100th, 100th percentile outcome to be able to help this team in that win now phase. And right now, it's it just feels really frustrating. We're obviously dealing with a brutal loss to the Green Bay Packers last night. Another second to last week embarrassing showing. Uh, Matt Freeze, a uh, friend of ours, uh, posted like... Uh, clips of four games where the Vikings just completely embarrassed themselves when they needed to win and all of them against the Packers. So they, they, they got to figure this out. It's just, it's a brutal one. And I, I don't think it's going to a full rebuild because you're not getting rid of Darius. You're not getting rid of Jefferson. Like you still have peace to build with and they're going to have to figure it out. Yeah, Miles, do you think Harrison Smith has probably played his last game as a member of the Minnesota Vikings? I mean, he actually had that great game against Carolina earlier this year, but you know, there's other moments to this year where he just looks like maybe age is catching up to him to a little bit. Do you think we've seen the last of Harrison Smith in a Vikings uniform? Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're at that point. And whether it's up to whether Harrison makes that decision, I think the Vikings are are probably gonna make that decision this offseason for him if he's not willing to. I just think the money's too big. I don't expect him to want to take another pay cut. There's no guaranteed money left in his deal. So um, if you're him, it's either, you know, take a huge uh, pay cut, but also like maybe get a little bit more guaranteed money and chop off the last year of your deal. But at that point, you know, the Vikings might just be willing to move on because they have Josh Mattels who stepped up big this year. Theo Jackson's look good. um, And, uh, and obviously Cam Bynum has been good and they might look to extend Bynum in this off season or, you know, within that range. But, um, I don't think they're in a, a situation where Harrison Smith needs to be on this roster moving forward. Like as we talk about competitive rebuild, Harrison Smith's kind of on that back end and the end of his of his career, and you still need to continue to rebuild that roster. And you need as much cap space and flexibility as you can get. And he unfortunately provides some of that additional um, flexibility. And you know, you you thank him. He's going to be a, you know future Ring of Honor guy. I think he's a had a Hall of Fame level career. Um, we'll see what happens at the end of it all, but um, obviously one of the one of the great Vikings players of the last twenty years, and so um, you wish him well and you say thank you. But I think it's one of those situations where you kind of you kind of got to the decisions kind of been should have been made um, by the end of this year that uh, you got to move on. For no, uh, let, let's talk a little Jaron Hall here before we wrap on Purple Daily on draft. Do we have to? I'm sorry, man. I got you know I got to get go down here. Um, yeah, he gets the start. And gets pulled at halftime. Doesn't really look comfortable. Throws a duck to Justin Jefferson. Um, what did you make of Jaron Hall's performance? And did you think he was probably deserving of being benched uh, after the first half against the Packers? Yeah, he absolutely should have been benched. And it's it's really difficult. I haven't watched the All-22 yet, so I, I don't have all the answers. Based on kind of what I watched, I'd put about 65% of it on Hall. Like He just didn't look comfortable out there. It looked like the moment was too big for him. And we didn't see that against the Falcons, but it was also a different situation. We're talking prime time. We're talking playoffs on the line. And I understand why O'Connell made the decision. Like He kept talking about turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. If you turn the ball over, you will get benched. Uh, Dobbs throws the four picks. He gets put on a short leash. He stinks against the Raiders, gets pulled. Mullins, six interceptions in two weeks, gets pulled. Hall has a really bad first half, two turnovers gets pulled. So at least we're seeing a little bit of consistency there. But for all of Hall's struggles, it just seemed like the offense just, he didn't show up. Christian Derrissaw looked like a JV player in the first half. That that strip sack, I, I don't really put any of that on Jaron Hall. And one of the tough parts is when you're dropping back like that, like I, I talked a lot about Kirk Cousins and when he drops back, you when you you get your, when you finish your drop back and you do that hitch, sometimes Kirk will do that second or third hitch. And that's what gets him in trouble. Hall hitched and started his throwing motion and gets whacked. Like you, if you're getting whacked at the very top of your drop back, that's not a good sign. And it's, it's setting your quarterback up to fail. Darius, just got worked by Preston Smith. 
throughout the entire first half. It was bad. It was very noticeable. And the entire offensive line stunk. They allowed 24 pressures. Garrett Bradbury had a PFF pass blocking grade of like 5.6. Ed Ingram, 19 points something. It was just a brutal performance. And I, I really didn't th- see them try to get Hall some easy completions right away. Throw a screen right away. Just get the ball out and get the ball in somebody's hands. Let him try to make a play. I liked the rollout initially, and he did that scramble for some yards, but get those easy completions. And I, I just thought Kevin O'Connell was calling a game like Kirk Cousins was playing quarterback, not trying to make things a little bit easier for his rookie. And that was really frustrating. But at the end of the day, Hall still was bad. And those as high as I was on him and how much I believed he could potentially be the guy in that high, the highest percentile outcome. I always warned there was a chance that this happened. He was a fifth round pick. And, you know, considering I was kind of the, the leader of the Jaron Hall train, it, it hurts me just a little bit extra, but it also doesn't mean his career is over. Like he may get the start on Sunday because you want to see him. Hey, how are you going to bounce back from this? His comments post game incredibly mature for a rookie. He's like, yeah, if I was coach, I would have benched me too. Like you don't get that kind of levity from a lot of rookies. So how's he going to bounce back? Yeah, I know it does. Um, And Wes Phillips talked about it in the the lead up to this game that they didn't have all the answers on hall because they, he hadn't been put in situations where they had answers to. Well, now they have more answers. And is it a situation where they're going to want to give him another opportunity to bounce back or be like, you know what? You just stunk. We're good. I'm very intrigued to see how they kind of play it moving forward. I do think Hall is still worth a roster spot as the developmental guy with the three QB rule that they have now, but there's really no way to spin it. Hall was not good on Sunday and it hurts my heart. Miles, what did you think of Jared Hall uh, yesterday? And obviously, does does this stunt his development? Does he still in the quarterback room for next year? Where did, what did you kind of make of Jared Hall's first NFL start yesterday against the Packers? I mean, I think it was clear from the jump that it just was a little too overwhelming for him, unfortunately. I, it just didn't look – it looked like the, bright, the the lights might have been a little bit too bright last night. Not That doesn't mean it, his career's over. It doesn't mean like, – like Forno was saying, it doesn't mean that he's, you know, he's dead in the water. But I think – they did the right thing by him by like taking him out at halftime. Cause I think those are, those are, it's tough. Situ- it's a tough situation as a coach to want to pull your starting quarterback, especially your rookie. But it's different to me in that situation where like, uh, was it, was it last week or the week before where people are calling for Nick Mullins to get benched for Jaron Hall? That to me is a different scenario than um, Jaron Hall getting benched for Nick Mullins, Nick Mullins having a rookie behind him. You want to let Nick Mullins is a veteran. So you let him kind of work through this, the struggles, the issues, because he's been around it, he's been there, he's done it. You know, can he continue to get past it? Whereas Jaron Hall, if you let him like get crushed as as often as he did, other, the amount of pressures, the amount of hits, and all that stuff, like just screw with his psyche, that can ruin his entire career. So it's a little bit of a different scenario where you pull him to kind of help him rather than keeping him in there as like a, as growing pains. And because some of those growing pains can kind of stick with you. So yeah, I, I would love. I think last night was a struggle for him. I think it was hard for them to kind of put things together. He missed some throws like that JG one down the sideline. You know, I think if he hits that throw that maybe that changes the entire outcome of that drive and that the entire outcome of that first half. But at least on the offensive side, you know, maybe they score a little bit more, um, more opportunities. But um, they, last night, just the whole team looked like they were dead, like from the jump. It just looked like they just were not ready to play football last night. And that's not just on Jaron Hall. That seemed on, on everybody. I do think it's hard to uh, adjust your scheme. I think what we saw – Kevin O'Connell wasn't really willing to adjust this scheme too much for Dobbs. Obviously not for Nick Mullins. It's clear he wasn't going to do it for Jaron Hall either, just in the simple fact that his offense is his offense. And if he thinks the guy's ready to play in it, then he's going to give you that offense. He's not going to change, you know, the route concepts too much. He's not going to do all that just to kind of appease Hall. And Hall is kind of that type of player we thought, at least I thought, like, and Nick Mullins too. Those two are similar to like what the Kirk Cousins type of, of quarterback is rather than Dobbs is his own own brand where there's a little bit more of the rushing ability and those things where Hall is more of a pocket passer who, who has escape and move ability, but um, you want him to kind of run that style of offense that Kirk's runs. He's obviously not Kirk Cousins, obviously not Nick Mullins to this point in his career, but I think it's hard to to say that you want to completely change your scheme. And, and I don't think that's what you're saying for no, but I do think there it's hard to 
to want to adjust too much of what you do just because your new quarterback comes in when that quarterback is kind of been set to run this same style of offense that Cousins and, and Mullins, Mullins runs. Yeah, it's going to be a fascinating next uh, few months here on Purple Daily on Draft, and we're going to have you covered on a bunch of different angles too. We'll obviously wrap things up at the end of the regular season next week with the Vikings. Who knows? Maybe they, in a weird scenario, which the seasons are, has been very, very weird. They are in the playoffs, but probably planning for uh, looking ahead towards the draft a lot on this show. So if you have anything you want us to discuss, hit us up in the YouTube comments. Hit us up on the Score North app. We'll gladly get into it. We'll be uh, uh, here every Monday on the Purple Daily YouTube channel and podcast feed. For Tyler Fornis, Miles Gorham, I'm Declan Goff. Hit that subscribe button for Daily Vikings Entertainment. We'll be at you next Monday.